All right, everybody, welcome back to the AJ Podcast. The first piece we'll be looking at is by Philippe de Champagne called Still Life with a Skull, made in 1671. The second piece is by Harman Steinwick, titled Still Life, Allegory of the Vanities of Human Life, made in 1640. All right, so today we'll be discussing the similarities between these two paintings, as well as their relationship to the style known as Memento Mori. But before we get into the paintings, I want to bring up some history behind these types of paintings, as well as the significance behind this reoccurring skull theme. As mentioned in the article by Curl, these skulls end up being the great equalizer in these paintings, eventually becoming an intermediary between the world of the living and the dead. The religion helped ignite this genre of painting due to these sculptures that were made of priests holding the skulls of their fallen saints. This style grew in interest in the 17th and 18th century when it became aligned with physical death, including the corpse, forming a new memento mori in which the images would be half skull and half flesh. Mm, kind of like all my paintings. Ja, 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 ja. <laughs> Alrighty, now that that's been said, let's take a look at our first piece. Before we do that, let me just take a look at it and look at that skull. Like, oh my gosh. The way that it's just like there and so lightly, and oh my gosh, it's really dark and really pretty. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I agree. You like that skull? Oh, it's beautiful. I know, right? <laughs> I can't even tell if it's male or female. I know, right? I wonder if we should really look that up or something. Anywho, before we get into this, let's look at the stylistics of this painting real quick. Look at the use of tenebrism, how the darkness consumes the skull and the other objects to emphasize the light hues on the figures. And the painting is also not too hyper-realistic, it is clearly painted as a canvas. Single light source from left makes painting look more dramatic in its message, mm -hmm. and the painting looks very symmetrical and well-balanced. Yeah, considering all the pieces are like so different, it still manages to be very symmetrical, which is really nice. And as we stated earlier, the um, skull clearly represents death, and so we presume that the hourglass represents time, considering the fact that life is so short. And the flower could also represent this aspect due to the fact that the flowers live an even shorter lifespan than we do. The flower could also be perceived as life, and how when we're born we will eventually bloom into our own selves. The uh, flower could also be interpreted as the artist representing all individuals, considering the flowers both male and female. So it'll make it a lot easier for all of the audience to understand and relate to the piece, as represented in the book by Janet Todd. Alright, our next artwork is by Steenwick, which also displays the classic skull being a symbol of death. And before we talk about that, I just want to bring up, doesn't that look like a genie lamp to you? Yeah, totally, with the little swirl of like flame what is it called it's like a smoke there we go a little smoke coming out i wonder if it's like a genie coming out or something like that could be like robin williams oh poor baby anywho so the stylistic details of this painting is it's much more realistic as opposed to champagnes but you can still easily tell that it's a painting on a canvas because it still has little pieces here and there where it's the paint is applied lightly so you can still kind of see the scratch marks and texture of the actual canvas and unlike the previous painting, the symmetry is a bit more off balance here. So as you can see, a lot of the objects, or pretty much all of the objects, are bunched up into the bottom right corner, and there's a clear open space in the upper left-hand side of the painting. All right, as explained <clears throat> in the book by Kristen Cousin, the compass can be interpreted that life can go in many directions and how we have no control over it. The books can easily represent knowledge and how it is the key to power and wealth, considering during this time period, the only wealth wealthy had access to books. The sword is a symbol of the strength of the individual or even their honor. The object in the upper right-hand side is possibly an urn, which could perhaps keep the individual eternally beautiful for the family's sake of remembering their loved ones. When you look at the shell, it kind of reminds us both of the of birth, kind of like the birth of Venus, only ours doesn't have the naked lady on it. <laughs> true, true. And so the shell also seems to, be, to appear very feminine and can even be taken as a representation to all individuals, kind of like Champagne's flower. However, we could just be perceiving it in this manner due to the fact of our social conditioning to associate cells with the feminine aspects. But I think that pretty much wraps up our little discussion today, don't you think? Our little podcast? Yeah, I think it's pretty wrapped up. But yeah. um, mm -hmm. 
<laughs> but yeah, but I have to be honest though, I feel like we could have included a lot more dark humor in this, don't you agree? I agree. Kind of like how the uh, the sword could have been the one that was used to cut the baby in half in King Solomon's story. <laughs> wow, indeed I could. Alright you guys, I guess that means we are out today. Hope you enjoyed and have a good one. Hero.